evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's lecture. Um, I'm Margaret Cavanis, the Research and Publications Program Manager at the Center for Ethics and Culture. And on behalf of our director, Carter Sneed, I want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd just like to say a word about the work we do at the Center for Ethics and Culture and our mission to promote the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition both here at Notre Dame and in the public square. The Center seeks to engage the most pressing and complex questions of ethics, culture, and public policy today through teaching, research, and dialogue, and particularly through events such as this evening's lecture, which will explore the emerging ethical crises surrounding euthanasia both in Europe and here in the United States. We're grateful to Dr. Comrade for joining us this evening to share his expertise and insight. The Center would also like to thank Professor Michael Waddell, the Aquinas Chair in Philosophy at St. Mary's College, for his collaboration and co-sponsorship of this evening's event. And just a quick word about the format. After Dr. Conrad finishes his remarks, we'll have some time for questions. We have a handheld mic that I'll pass around, which will just help for the recording, if you wouldn't mind waiting for that before asking your question. And then afterwards, we'll have a reception in the atrium where you're all welcome to join us and continue the conversation. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Dr. Mark Comrade is the ethicist in residence for the Shepherd Pratt Health Systems, where he chaired the ethics committee for over 20 years. He's on the teaching faculty of Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland, as well as a member of the Assembly of the American Psychiatric Association. He previously served six years on the APA Ethics Committee and helped craft the new APA position statement on euthanasia, which reads, a, psychiatric, a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer an intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. Dr. Comrade lectures widely throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe on the ethical concerns surrounding voluntary euthanasia of psychiatric patients in Belgium and the Netherlands, and he has consulted with policymakers in Canada, New Zealand, the UK, Norway, and Sweden in an effort to dissuade those nations from establishing or extending laws that would permit physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, particularly for psychiatric patients. Dr. Conrad also maintains a private practice and appears regularly on TV, radio, and podcasts to discuss topics in psychiatry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Conrad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, I uh, want to thank, uh, first of all, very much for the invitation. Uh, this glorious university, this is my first time here. I'm particularly uh, grateful to Dr. Michael Waddell of the uh, St. Mary's College around the corner and the Center for Ethics uh, and Culture uh, for the privilege of being able to share with you something that uh, has become of uh, extraordinary importance to me. I have been a clinician, a psychiatrist, for 35 years. And in that career, I've also cultivated a, uh, an interest and uh, a lot of uh, devotion and activity in medical ethics. Uh, and frankly, uh, 35 years of being an ethicist and a practicing clinician, I fe feel uh, of all the issues that I've confronted of uh, ethical import in the domain of uh, psychiatry and behavioral health, uh, I feel like uh, the one that I'm going to speak to you about tonight is probably the most significant, uh, probably uh, uh, in, in a way the most disturbing and shocking, and to the extent that it actually has somewhat transformed my life from being an ethicist who's a teacher, a writer, uh, a uh, consultant uh, in clinical situations into somewhat of an activist. Uh, that is how far this issue has run me up the flagpole uh, in terms of uh, how it affects me and how I think it affects my profession uh, and, frankly, my patients uh, and the world. Uh, so I, my duty tonight is to transmit to you uh, some information uh, that is behind the way in which this information has transformed me. Uh, and in the words of... Uh, the, I'm not sure how, excuse me, some reason or another, my, there we go. So in the words of, of Melville, woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall, uh, because uh, I really intend to share with you a sense of being appalled. Uh, the way in which this issue has inverted, uh, I believe, the fundamental uh, principles, uh, ethics, uh, the mission uh, 
uh, of what it means to be a physician in general and psychiatrist in particular. So as I said to you, I really live at the intersection between medicine and philosophy. Uh, and frankly, Camus tells us that there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Uh, and that is very much, uh, as a practicing psychiatrist, the dom do domain that I think uh, we are focusing on tonight, suicide. Uh, the ordinary definition of which by the Centers for Disease Control is death caused by self-directed behavior with an intent to die. A very straightforward definition. And yet, the American Association of Suicidality, Suicidology, excuse me, just this January, decided to parse the definition and say legal physician assistant deaths should not be considered to be cases of suicide, uh, which as a practicing psychiatrist uh, really uh, in my mind is uh, beggar's belief, uh, but in fact uh, they want to be able to create a space uh, whereby we can understand uh, a distinction between suicide as we ordinarily talk about it and suicide in the sense that we're going to talk about it tonight. So, frankly, even though I've been endeavoring at the intersection of ethics and psychiatry, uh, I was unaware of the remarkable uh, practices that I'm going to share with you this evening, uh, which I believe have actually been hiding in plain sight. As a matter of fact, it is not until 2015 that this appeared in my inbox, this New Yorker article, uh, the death treatment, when should people with non-terminal illness be helped to die? And uh, in it, we learn Belgian law allows euthanasia for patients who suffer from severe and incurable distress, including psychological disorders. Uh, as I poked around further at that remarkable article, I came across uh, this in uh, the Washington Post, and uh, Chuck Lane and I have since uh, become collaborators on this issue, uh, where he wrote in August 2015, if you were a psychiatrist and a chronically depressed patient told you he wanted to die, what would you do? In Belgium, you might prescribe this vulnerable, desperate person a fatal dose of sodium thiopental. Well, looking around even further, I came across uh, this documentary, which uh, I invite you all to watch on YouTube uh, for free, called 24 and Ready to Die. Uh, and I've cobbled together a three-minute montage from this documentary where we follow this young woman, 24-year-old Emily, uh, as she goes through the process of applying for and being granted uh, the right uh, to a euthanasia procedure for her uh, chronic psychiatric disorder. So let's hear from Emily. And I'm from Belgium. And this documentary is about my request for euthanasia because of mental suffering. And when you see this documentary, I'm, I won't be here anymore. When it comes to doctor assisted dying, Belgium has the most liberal laws in the world. This is Emily's story. From the outside, she's a physically healthy young woman with a loving family and friends. It appears Emily has everything to live for, but she finds her life unbearable. In 2013, there were more than 1,800 doctor-assisted deaths in Belgium. While 97% of cases involved people suffering terminal or chronic physical illness, 3% were people suffering psychiatric disorders, the most extreme and controversial form of assisted suicide. Belgium is one of only two countries that allow it. Strict criteria have to be met before doctor-assisted death is allowed. Emily's case has to go through dozens of medical professionals and ultimately be signed off by three doctors, one of whom is psychiatrist, Dr. Lieve Tienpont. I don't know if you at this moment sit yourself with questions that you want to talk about. For myself, in the last week, is the destructivity also very serious. Emily started her application to end her life nearly two years ago. 
denk dat we de meeste, of om niet te zeggen eigenlijk alle mensen met een euthanasievraag op basis van psychisch lijden, hebben een lang verhaal van psychisch lijden. Dus dat is helemaal verschillend van iemand die een, een acute depressie doet, bijvoorbeeld naar aanleiding van een rouw. Dat is juist de inschatting van de artsen hè, en de drie artsen die met de patiënt bezig zijn. Ja, want binnen psychiatrie, de, de mogelijkheden zijn oneindig. Hè. Medicatie, combinatie van medicatie met ambulante residentiële therapieën kunnen we verder doen. Maar het moeten eerlijke kansen zijn waarvan we echt weten dat het perspectief kan bieden. En bij sommige mensen hebben we die niet, zoals we dat in, in sommige kankersituaties ook niet meer hebben. Is dat ook zo bij psychisch lijden. Soms hebben we niet meer, uh, niks meer te bieden. Apologies for the subtitles. Hopefully you could read them. Uh, we'll hear more from that psychiatrist, Dr. Lee of Pienpont, one of the leaders of psychiatric euthanasia in Belgium, shortly. But uh, spoiler alert, uh, the uh, documentary goes on to follow Emily and she mugs across the rooftops of Brussels and she sits and says goodbye to all of her friends and has goodbye parties and so forth. And we follow her right up to the moment that the psychiatrist comes to start the IV uh, injection to kill her. And at the last minute, uh, she decides to relent. So uh, apparently being the subject of a major economist documentary was somewhat therapeutic for her, gave her kind of a purpose and a meaning. And as a matter of fact, this is part of the argument uh, in Belgium uh, and the Netherlands that it can be therapeutic to lead people to the edge of the cliff and have them peer over uh, and have the option to jump. But uh, knowing that that option is there, they can comfortably put it in their back pocket uh, and retreat. Uh, and be able to distance themselves from chronic suicidal feelings. And that's exactly what happened to Emily, who, as far as I know, uh, has been able to track down, is still alive to this day. So the point is, is that I myself missed the memo. Uh, and indeed, is when I go around speaking to audiences around uh, the country, uh, in Europe, and so forth, many people don't realize what actually has been going on there that is not just theoretical, but as we will soon see, there are actually psychiatric patients who are being provided suicide, uh, often by the very same physicians who were trying to prevent their suicide uh, up until a certain point. So I think that uh, one of my missions is to sort of ring out the alarm bell. I travel the country, I call it my Paul Revere tour, to sound out the alarm about what is happening. And I indeed, I and many other uh, experts in medical ethics uh, absolutely expect this to be coming to our shores, uh, and we need to be ready for it. All right, so let's delve in a little more into the subject. Let's begin with some definitions, as Humpty Dumpty says. A word means what I want it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. And there are many words, many phrases that have been attached to the procedures that we're talking about tonight. Dan Callahan of the Hastings Center for many years calls it organized obfuscation. There are terms like physician-assisted suicide, voluntary euthanasia, compassionate assistance to die, Physician-assisted dying in Canada, the preferred term is MAID or medical aid and dying. There's a, in Australia, the big movement is go gently Australia. Death with dignity, medical murder. You see, you can kind of pitch this and spin this according to your point of view, really much like the abortion debate. Uh, Dr. Kevorkian of uh, ignoble memory uh, wanted to introduce the term medicide, never quite caught on. Uh, this curious uh, alliance of organizations around the world called the World Federation of Right to Die Societies is now trying to introduce another new speak term, uh, dignicide. Uh, as, frankly, I think that word probably captures uh, the attempt to twist and, and possibly even murder language uh, around this to lead us in whatever direction the opponents or proponents want to lead us. This interesting organization, World Federation of Right to Die Societies, its director, physician Rob Jean Cuillère, uh, himself says, uh, remarks on the twisting of language. I always refrain from using the word killing. You terminate life, and actually more than that, you terminate the suffering. Get used to that idea because it is counter-human a little bit. My grad kids came to visit. They talked mostly about world politics, kept asking me how I felt about the youth in Asia, all sorts of ways you can turn the language. But basically, uh, let's uh, define a couple of terms. In, in terms of increasing moral complexity, uh, the basic level is assisted dying, also called passive euthanasia. 
This right now is the ethical status quo where we're at, which is uh, the right to refuse treatment or pulling the plug or stepping away and getting out of the way of death. Uh, it may or may not be accompanied, hopefully it would be, with palliative care, uh, the state of the art of which is actually quite advanced, far more advanced than people realize, although not always accessible. So that's uh, assisted dying or passive euthanasia. The second uh, level is called physician-assisted suicide. Here, uh, the doctor writes a prescription, uh, typically for barbiturates that the patient takes to the pharmacy uh, and gets uh, what is called by the, the proponents a box o barbs uh, and puts it in the closet uh, to use at the time of his or her own choosing. Of course, assuming that uh, her suicidal granddaughter doesn't discover it and get to it first uh, and takes it uh, with or without monitoring, with or without family coercion. This physician-assisted suicide the jurisdictions that we will soon see in the United States, this is the practice in the United States. However, for the rest of the world uh, that we'll also be talking about, the most controversial and highest, uh, most complex level is euthanasia. And euthanasia means actively killing a patient uh, characteristically with an IV intravenous, just like in lethal execution in a prison, the doctor starts an IV, with a lethal, lethal uh, concoction, pushes the IV, and within minutes, uh, the patient dies by the hands of the physician. So there's no removal of the physician from the process. So we're gonna be focusing mostly on the last two uh, for the rest of this talk, physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. But basically, the paradigm is the patient is asking or wanting to die, and we in psychiatry use the word suicidal to describe that, uh, and in, th in that wish asks the physician to create a treatment plan whereby death is administered. Not death is allowed, but that death is administered. And so all of these, uh, 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 these latter two approaches really participate in that paradigm. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of this. I find it interesting, maybe even slight, slightly amusing, that the person who coined the term euthanasia was named Comachus. Uh, in ancient Greece, uh, a poet, he actually, well, euthanasia was simply meant a good death. But it came to mean a good death as provided for and administered by physicians. Now, euthanasia uh, was actually a very common practice in ancient Greece, where uh, the centers of medicine were organized around religion, much like having Catholic hospitals uh, contemporaneously, uh, it was organized around the worship of the god Asclepius. Uh, and the cults of Asclepius were the uh, healing centers where doctors were trained, patients came for healing. And they were uh, based on their own uh, liturgy and their own uh, texts and mythology. And the core mythology uh, involved uh, Medusa, that uh, was the uh, deity that could turn you to stone if you looked at her. Uh, but the legend was that Athena drew blood from both sides of Medusa's neck. One side was a life-giving elixir, the other side was a toxic, deadly poison, and she gave both vials to the god Asclepius. Uh, and that in the Asclepia, uh, where physicians practiced in ancient Greece, uh, they utilized both sides uh, of the power of medicine, the power to heal and save life, and the power to take away life, with one exception. Uh, and that one exception was in the Asclepian of Hippocrates. Uh, and Hippocrates uh, was uh, a very interesting uh, character historically, and his school on the island of Kos, uh, the Hippocratic Asclepian, was unique. It was unique because there, Hippocrates had a much broader sense of what it meant to be a healer, and established a kind of covenantial community. Uh, that if you wanted to be a physician there, one had to uh, evince certain values, had to embrace certain values. Indeed, beyond that, one had to actually take an oath. Uh, and in that oath, one would profess those values. As a matter of fact, that is the origin and root of the word profession, to profess values. And uh, those specific set of values which distinguished the Hippocratic group from the others uh, revolved around certain core concepts, and the most fundamental concept uh, is incorporated now into the Hippocratic Oath with 
which millennia of physicians have taken, and many still to this day, uh, though it's been modified. But one piece that's never been modified over the ages is this distinctive feature, uh, piece that distinguishes it from the other Asclepia. I will not give a fatal drug to anyone if I am asked. Neither will I counsel any man to do so. So I want to emphasize that this is the root out of which the mighty tree of medicine grew, much in the same way as the mighty tree of Christianity grew out of the root of the uh, cult of Jesus Christ, uh, and uh, which was a number, uh, as many of you know, who are far better scholars of this than I in this audience, there was a number of, of groups uh, around that time that were uh, eschatological and apocalyptic groups uh, that uh, competed in the uh, marketplace of ideas, but the idea of one really became uh, ascendant and fertilized uh, and nourished the great tree of values that then has grown out of it over the next 2,500 years. Uh, uh, well, actually, 2,500 for my profession of the Hippocratic tree, 2,000 for uh, Christ Christianity. So this is an even older tradition. Uh, so that the very roots uh, of the profession, what it means to profess the values of medicine, are very much built on this uh, particularly distinctive idea. Uh, Ed Pellegrino uh, of the Kennedy Institute of Bioethics said, an oath can be the magnetic core that can help to create a moral community, creating a sense of collective responsibility for a profession. Uh, the great Margaret Mead, writing to a psychiatrist friend, uh, once wrote, the followers of Hippocrates were dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, regardless of rank, age, or intellect, the life of a slave, emperor, foreign man, defective child. This is a priceless legacy which we cannot afford to tarnish, but society has repeatedly attempted to make the physician into the killer. It is the duty of society to protect the physician from such requests. So I, I stand before you today as a physician, and I know that in general, Society these days doesn't care much about protecting the rights of physicians. So I, as a medical ethicist, feel that uh, one of my charges is to keep an eye on, or at least to provide some stewardship over what it means to profess in the house of medicine, what are the values of the covenantal community of medicine. Uh, and as Margaret Mead has said, there have been a number of attempts to assault that value, which uh, my uh, community of medicine through its codes, through its ethics, as I will show you some more contemporary examples, uh, has tried to uh, defend itself uh, against the demands of society. Uh, and I'll be giving a talk, some of you may be attending tomorrow, uh, about the time in earlier in the 20th century when both in the United States and then later in Germany, uh, the medical profession really succumbed. Uh, to the demands of society, lost its moorings of its profession, and got swept out to sea with some pretty heinous participation in some uh, remarkably changing social mores. Now, when we're talking history, we must pause then at this particular point, uh, which is uh, pre-Nazi Germany, when a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist, Alfred Hoch, uh, wrote a book called Allowing the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Life. Uh, Hoch actually was the very first person to articulate the term death with dignity. In this book, which became uh, one of Hitler's most uh, favorite uh, intellectual underpinnings, uh, he was said to have read it three times. So Hoch writes, not even the Hippocratic Oath is really binding anymore. The intellectual level of the mentally ill person is that of very low animal life. Remember, this is a psychiatrist. Such individuals are not just absolutely worthless, but are of negative values. We doctors know that in the interest of the whole human organism, single, less valuable members have to be abandoned and pushed out. Hermann Goring echoed this by saying, Christian morality and enlightenment humanism were stupid, false, and unhealthy ideas of humanity. And Adolf Hitler said, it is right that the worthless lives of such creatures, referring to the mentally ill, should be ended, and that this would result in certain savings in terms of hospitals, doctors, and nursing staff. And indeed, thus was born the T4 program, named after the mansion that Tiergarten Strasse co-opted from a Jewish family, 
where I will talk more about tomorrow for those who want to attend over at St. Mary's, I believe. Uh, psychiatrists uh, basically invented the Holocaust, uh, developing psychiatrists, developing the methods of mass killing that were first deployed on the mentally ill, particularly mentally ill children, then progressing to mentally ill adults. Uh, one of uh, the most distinguished psychiatrists of the 20th century uh, was uh, Leo Alexander from Harvard. He was sent to the Nuremberg trials, and uh, he oversaw the entire doctor's trials part. There was a separate set of trials for the Nazi doctors who had participated in experiments and so forth, and the T4 program. And he wrote up uh, his, uh, uh, what he learned from uh, a year and a half of interviewing these doctors in this famous New England Journal article in 1949, Medicine Under Dictatorship. And I just want to bring out one particular passage from this article. The beginnings at first were a mere subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. It started with the acceptance of the attitude basic in the euthanasia movement that there is such a thing as life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick, and gradually the sphere was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the technologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally, all non-Germans. It is important to realize, and this is the take-home sentence, that the infinitely small, wedged-in levels from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitatable sick, which is, as a matter of fact, the very cohort that we're discussing this evening. All right, jumping forward to more contemporary times, those of you who are old enough may recognize the, the smiling and happy Dr. Kevorkian at your service, uh, who set up his uh, suicide machines for patients that would want it. So where are we now with this in the United States? Well, in the US, there are currently eight jurisdictions for which physician-assisted suicide, remember that second level, is now legally uh, allowed for people who are terminally ill, meaning six to 12 months prognosis to live with or without treatment. Uh, and by the way, terminal illness is in itself a very elusive uh, and difficult to pin down and not particularly reliable concept in, uh, in medical science of, of prognosis. But these are the jurisdictions in which it's allowed. And it's important to know that in uh, with the exception of Hawaii, there is never any requirement for a mental health assessment. Uh, the evaluating physicians do not have to be psychiatrists, and if they do not think that there is uh, a reason to have a psychiatric consultation, uh, none is obtained. Uh, Hawaii, just, uh, which is the latest to come to this party, just instituted a law that uh, says that yes, one mental health consultation is necessary, just to be sure, one, that the person is competent, and two, that uh, they're not suffering from mental disorder. It could be done by a social worker or a psychologist, but uh, one is required. Uh, the, in none of these states does uh, any of the physicians uh, doing this have to have any special training in mental health assess assessment. Uh, you need a second opinion, but that second opinion can be anybody, including a doctor from, who's in practice with you. Uh, so it doesn't have to be truly independent. No prior knowledge of a patient is required, so people can set up sort of shops where folks can come and uh, get this approved. So you don't have to have had a long-standing relationship with the doctor. This is a very important part of any law that we're going to look at tonight. Patients, the, 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 uh, the ethical status quo that patients can refuse treatment, uh, which has really been observed for several decades now, the right to refuse treatment, holds in this. So patients can refuse treatments and None of these laws uh, talk about how the patient becomes terminally ill. So they all allow a patient to make him or herself terminally ill by refusing treatment, stopping your insulin, stopping your, your uh, dialysis, uh, if indeed the decisions that you make result in your condition becoming terminal, terminal you are now legally, at least, uh, a potential candidate for being approved for your box of barbs. Uh, Physician-assisted suicide cannot be listed on a death certificate at all. Uh, we can't really do a lot of research. You have to say what the underlying condition was, cancer or whatever. You cannot say suicide or assisted suicide on it. And no witness is required at the time to make sure that the person isn't being coerced. 
uh, however lovingly, however gently, however subtly, uh, no protections against coercion. So if you uh, study the top reasons why people report they want assisted suicide in Oregon and Washington, which were the first states to have this come online in the late 1990s, the top reasons, losing autonomy, inability to engage in activities, the loss of dignity, the losing control of bodily functions, what all of these things have in common is fear. Fear, in fact, very few people ask for this because they're in pain. It's always afraid of being in pain, afraid of those things. Fear, anxiety, actually, as a matter of fact, the very things that happen to be in my wheelhouse as a psychiatrist, uh, something that if you would give me a crack at, independent of whatever the diagnosis is, we have a skill set to be able to minister to fear. But as I said, having mental health professionals as part of the process is not in any way required. Uh, as Montagna said, he who fears he shall suffer, already suffers what he fears. There's now an advancing debate over, indeed, once we've opened the door to one segment of society uh, that we say suicide is rational, is eligible. Uh, now the uh, argument is expanding to rational suicide in general, perhaps not even, uh, as we'll see in Europe, this is part of the discussion there, not even needing a health condition. Uh, but indeed, uh, we should maybe be considering the uh, ultimate extension of autonomy and self-determination that really anybody ought to be able to have access to means to commit suicide uh, under whatever circumstances they may uh, wish to reflect on. This was just in the New York Times. Uh, so that's sort of the, the uh, cutting edge of the conversation here, uh, which as you'll soon see echoes what's going on in Europe. Let's spend a couple of minutes on Canada. So, uh, as early as 2014, the Canadian Medical Association started to soften its stance. And this is often what happens as the medical society starts to uh, have divisiveness within it and it begins to soften its language. But uh, ultimately, uh, a Supreme Court case in Canada called Carter versus Canada in uh, 20, uh, 2016, which involved a woman with advanced spinal stenosis uh, who was uh, seeking uh, the court's permission to have uh, her doctor kill her, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada decided that it was time to address this problem legislatively, directed the Parliament uh, of Canada to study the law, uh, to study the situation and come up with some legislation about it. And so in June uh, 2016, the so-called C-14 law uh, was passed in Canada. And in that law, uh, they, uh, now federal law in Canada, uh, that uh, people can be eligible for assisted suicide or euthanasia if their conditions are considered uh, irremediable, uh, namely untreatable, and intolerable. And again, this is the, the European model. And uh, the patient's claim that their condition is insufferable is irrefutable. The patient is the uh, ultimate and only expert allowed to weigh in on that criteria. However, the criteria, uh, and, and by the way, the suffering, there are no distinctions made. Uh, again, this is the European model, as we'll see, between physical and mental suffering. So suffering is suffering is suffering. Uh, but the patient can also refuse certain treatments. Uh, again, that ethical status quo is preserved. So if a condition is untreatable, that may not simply be the judgment of the medical team, but also the decision of the patient who has said, look, I, I understand you have some treatments for me, but I don't want those treatments. I'm not prepared to, to accept those treatments. So for example, in psychiatry, we have electroconvulsive therapy, which actually is a very, very effective treatment for treatment resistant depression. But if the patient doesn't want it, and that's all we have, the patient has now uh, weighed in and participated in the decision that their condition is uh, irremediable. Uh, in Canada, as elsewhere, it's almost exclusively euthanasia, 99% of the time, not the, the box o' barbs. Uh, now, in Canada, they've invented their own term that is unique in the world, uh, and the concept is death must be reasonably foreseeable. So it's not terminally ill, and this usual definition of six to 12 months, uh, it just must be reasonably foreseeable, and the statute deliberately avoids defining what that is. So death 
natural death in the foreseeable future. There have been many cases euthanized where death is predicted within one year, four years, even six years. Uh, the, uh, it's somewhere there towards the end of life, but is much looser actually than any concept of terminal illness that we have in the United States. Now, because of that death in the foreseeable future concept, uh, it implicitly, this excludes psychiatric patients, but not explicitly. And many advocates are now pushing to allow psychiatric patients to have that under you know, the usual tropes that we have been uh, really getting behind in the mental health community about parity and non-discrimination and being able to treat mental disorders the same as physical disorders and so forth. Uh, but, um, and we're expecting at the end of this month a uh, study group from uh, the Canadian Parliament to rule uh, as to whether or not the law should be extended to psychiatric patients uh, and minors. Uh, and those of us who've been watching closely expect those doors to very much open uh, within the next several weeks in Canada. They've been very active. So remember, it started in 2016. In 2017 alone, you can see there's just between the first half and the second half of the year, there's been a 30% increase in euthanasias in Canada. Uh, so that uh, there were uh, over 2,600 euthanasias in 2017 there. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, the Canadian Association for Retired People, sort of their equivalent of AARP, their uh, executive vice president actually lost her job because they uh, did not like her neutral. She was rather neutral on euthanasia, uh, and the retired uh, community felt they needed somebody who was much more vociferous and a much stronger advocate and supporter of euthanasia. So she was fired. And now the new president and their new policy are calling for all publicly funded institutions in Canada to provide MAVE. Remember, that's a Canadian term, made it medical assistance in dying. I just want to remind you that, uh, like in the United States, many hospitals uh, are Catholic uh, in Canada. And indeed, the penetrance of the Catholic Church into the hosp uh, hospital and healthcare community in Canada is far greater than it is in the United States. But they many of them receive federal funding as well. So the CARP up there wants those institutions to not necessarily stand on the basis of any kind of religious principles. We'll see in a moment this issue of conscientious objectors. So there are some docs that are really unhappy about this, who are, who've tried it, who find it very distressing, who want their names taken off the list of people that will participate in this. However, Canada is now uh, uh, displaying a, a remarkable uh, new theme, which I personally call Euthanasia 2.0. What is Euthanasia 2.0? Okay, now that it's, it's out in the field, the horse is out of the barn, now the issue becomes what do you do with conscientious objectors, with physicians who don't want to participate? Well, in Ontario, uh, they have decided both ethically and legally uh, that you must, at some level, be part of at least the referral chain, even if you, as a physician, are not willing to administer euthanasia your, uh, yourself. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons say that an effective referral must be provided. In other words, if you don't provide an effective referral, uh, at least to somebody that might be willing to consider it, you are being an unethical physician. Uh, in fact, the president of the Saskatchewan College of Physicians and Surgeons said, if doctors have conscientious, uh, conscientious objections, maybe they shouldn't be doctors. Uh, the uh, courts in Ontario have ruled that uh, uh, conscience rights are not going to be legally permissible, that legally now a physician in Ontario must somehow or another, you, could, you cannot abandon your patient. If your patient comes to you and wants to have uh, euthanasia, uh, and you're not willing to do that, you have to provide some way of helping the person find their way into the system uh, where they can. So it is neither ethical nor legal to be a conscientious objector in the province of Ontario. Here are uh, two scholars, of uh, oncologist and an ethicist, uh, who basically maintain that conscientious objection is not a principled stance, uh, it's just a disguise for squeamishness. Uh, they say most objections are more emotional. We need to change the medical community's mindset through education. Conscientious objection is a loophole to justify refusal. 
Uh, so we need to start gearing up to reformat uh, the minds of young physicians to try to teach them to get over their squeamishness about killing their patients. So it's really a remarkable uh, uh, trend that's going on in Canada. Uh, one in which, by the way, uh, uh, Europe has long ago conquered uh, by making uh, certain uh, institutions of euthanasia available to patients as we will now see. So let's cross the Atlantic uh, and find out really how all of this started uh, because this is the origin of this metastatic practice uh, that is now coming to Canada and the United States. So in 2002, the Benelux countries, Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, all struck similar laws. And those laws basically made uh, euthanasia, as well as assisted suicide, but it's, nobody really wants assisted suicide. It's euthanasia, 99% of the time, made that a legal practice. Uh, it removed any distinctions between terminal and non-terminal conditions, and it removed, effaced any of the distinctions between physical and mental suffering. So as a result, once non-terminal mental suffering became a potential domain in which euthanasia could actually be practiced, uh, that's when psych patients, psychiatric patients, began to get in line. So the criteria there, and you saw this reflected in the Canadian law, is merely that the condition has to be unbearable or insufferable, remember the patient decides, and untreatable. Uh, and again, the patient may refuse treatment, so the patient gets a vote in the untreatable dimension as well as in the unbearable dimension. Uh, these countries do allow advanced directives uh, for dementia. There are a couple of limitations on that. Uh, that is getting them into trouble this very week, as we'll get to. Uh, there's no explicit prohibition of uh, tourism for euthanasia. You don't have to necessarily be a citizen of the country to have it. And uh, most, uh, most of it is euthanasia, occasional assisted suicide, but that's done by appointment usually so that the physician watches you as you take the medication. So that all has been unfolding since 2002. Now let's look at some of the data that we've been able to get out of these countries, starting with the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, uh, there's really been quite a remarkable increase uh, since these laws came online, about a 350% increase. Uh, next year, the numbers will uh, exceed 7,000 people uh, who have been killed by euthanasia. Uh, in 2017, uh, between uh, four and five out of 100 human beings who die in the Netherlands are dying at the hands of a physician, are dying by lethal injection. So between 4.6% 4, 4 of all deaths of human beings are being produced by their doctors uh, in 2017. Uh, according to New England Journal, as many as 23% may be unreported, so this may be a significant, uh, significantly low number. Now, if we look at just psychiatric conditions, uh, they only represent uh, a little over 1% of all those people are psych patients, but you see that they're growing. In 2017, there were 83 psychiatric patients. Now, I've uh, separated out here traditional psychiatric illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other things from dementia, which frankly I and most psychiatrists consider one of our illnesses as well. It's in our DSM, it's part of neuropsychiatry. So uh, just breaking out dementia separately, if you look at dementia only, uh, you can see the numbers are uh, over twice as high as for other psychiatric disorders. So taken all together, we're talking about uh, several hundred psychiatric uh, patients that were euthanized uh, on request uh, between 2016 and 2017 in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, there are two paths available. One path is working through your personal physician. Another path is a special clinic called an end-of-life clinic. Both paths lead to your planned death. Uh, and the end-of-life clinic, known as the Lievenzijnde Kliniks, uh, are available uh, especially used by people whose personal physician doesn't want to do it. So this is how they've taken care of conscientious objection in the Netherlands. Uh, if you don't want to do it, your patient can knock on the door of the Lievenzijnde clinic. Uh, 
Now let's take a look at uh, some of the statistics out of this. First, the path via your own doctor. So here's one study of 66 psychiatric patients over these three years who were euthanized by their own uh, physician, or at least their own physician was approving of it. Uh, it just shows you some array of the diagnoses. Uh, not surprisingly, most of them had mood disorders, some anxiety, PTSD, psychosis, there were others. Uh, however, half of them had personality disorders. Uh, these are problems of traits uh, as opposed to states. And there are some personality disorders which have, as part of their phenomenology, chronic persistent suicidal thinking, one of which may be known to members of the audience here, borderline personality disorder. Turns out that's the most common diagnosis of the personality disorder patients. Now, remember, you're allowed to refuse treatment. So over half of patients, of these 66 patients, had refused one or more recommended treatments. Uh, they had refused ECT, they had refused certain medications, uh, had refused inpatient uh, hospital treatment, which is you know, a very high level of intensity of treatment. The main reasons why they refused, they weren't motivated, they were worried about side effects, they were skeptical about the efficacy, frankly, the kinds of reluctances that are part of the daily fare of a psychiatrist uh, trying to treat people. These are pretty common reasons to be reluctant to participate in psychiatric treatment. If you look at the personality disorders, this, this is un, unpublished material uh, communicated to me by uh, Scott Kim at NIMH, who's one of the main people actually gathering this data from the Netherlands. Almost a third of people with personality disorders never had any psychotherapy. I mean, psychotherapy is like the indication uh, for uh, the most important part of treating personality disorders. One out of every three of the euthanized psychiatric patients had refused and never had any psychotherapy. Uh, Two-thirds cited as their major reason uh, social isolation and loneliness, uh, which indeed is uh, very endemic in the chronic mentally ill population. Now, you're supposed to get second opinion, consultation, uh, and that second opinion is not necessarily binding. 24% an independent consultant disagreed, but they were euthanized anyway. Half of those independent consultants were psychiatrists. By the way, if you're a psych patient, though it's recommended the, se the second opinion be a psychiatrist, it doesn't have to be a psychiatrist, which is actually quite remarkable. And uh, in terms of who finally pushed the needle, uh, almost uh, three quarters of them were killed at the sharp end of a syringe pushed by their own long-standing treating psychiatrist, the very same psychiatrist who had been trying to prevent their suicide low these many years, uh, became in the end, went down the rabbit hole and colluded with the suicide and provided the suicide for them. So what about the end of life clinics, the other route, the Levenzinda clinics? You can see an exponential increase in the number of patients euthanized there. Uh, th it's actually one clinic that has about 60 traveling teams that uh, go out to the countryside in trailers uh, or rent uh, office space temporarily. The typical evaluation in the Levenzinda clinic, about one to one and a half hour, hours. Patients are typically new to the evaluating physician. These aren't the long-standing patients like we saw uh, in the other cohort. Uh, and uh, they've really taken off. You can see the percent of all euthanasias. Uh, it's up to uh, last year, uh, over 11% are taking place in these clinics. And uh, however, it's a very popular place for psych patients to go. I only have the data for 2016, but 77% of all psych patients got their euthanasia in one of these end-of-life clinics in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, here's one study uh, of, from the year 2012 to 2013 at a clinic. There were 645 requests. Of those, 121 were psych patients. Uh, and of those 121, six were granted their euthanasia. Half of them sent back to their own psychiatrist who was uh, ready to, uh, to provide that service. So this is about 5% of, of psych patients were approved. I want you to remember that number because we're going to come back to that when we look at a slide from Belgium. So uh, the medical societies have really gotten on board uh, with this. The Dutch Psychiatric Association and the Dutch Medical Association, rather than objecting, uh, they've kind of fallen into line. That's the law of the land now. They've both published pamphlets for their members about how to uh, comport with the law and how to do the evaluations and how to do the procedures and how to 
make sure you know, they stay within the limits of the guidelines. So uh, they've been uh, very much on board. They haven't in, in any way raised any specific objections. Uh, however, uh, some of that is changing uh, as especially the psychiatric euthanasias begin to accelerate. So in 2011, they asked physicians uh, in the Netherlands, uh, would euthanasia for psych patients be inconceivable to you? So 14% in 2011 said, yeah, no, no, I would never, we would never do a psych, uh, psych patient. However, by 2013, 60% said, oh, no, 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 no psych patient. So the, the stomach for euthanizing psych patients is changing there, and as a result, the medical society had to issue a new pamphlet saying, just because we can doesn't mean we should. So it goes further. Both the Minister of Health and the Minister of Justice uh, are now pushing for demedicalizing the criteria uh, so that you don't have to be chronically ill, non-terminally ill, terminally ill, forget about illness, uh, that now we've opened the door, let's extend it to simply those who say they're tired of living or who have completed life. As a matter of fact, the head of one of their leading political parties, the D66 party, Alexander Perchold, said we have to take it step by step. In 2002, we passed the euthanasia law for unbearable suffering. We can now take the next step for our civilization. And uh, that party is one of the big proponents behind uh, introducing a completed life criterion for medical euthanasia. Uh, and then, even still, uh, there are calls now for an over-the-counter suicide pill to take it out of the house of medicine just to allow people to have access to something with which they can kill themselves. And frankly, uh, as a physician, nourished in the root of that mighty tree that is grounded in the Hippocratic tradition, uh, I'm actually one nanogram more comfortable with this. Uh, not that I want this as public policy, but uh, to get it out of a doctor's office uh, actually uh, has, uh, has a certain appeal to it. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is being pushed by one of their retired Supreme Court justices, Oub Drion, uh, who wrote a famous essay, and hence this approach is called the Pill of Drion, and you can see the growth. I don't have any uh, more recent data, but I'm sure it's much higher than this from uh, my colleagues, from what my colleagues in the Netherlands are telling me. It's uh, very popular to uh, develop the pill of Drion. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a whole grassroots organization called the Dutch Voluntary Euthanasia Society, over a quarter of a million people, that is really behind trying to expand the criteria for euthanasia in the Netherlands. As a matter of fact, they put on every year a week of euthanasia, uh, a, set, a sem set of seminars. Uh, it's gonna be in February, it was, it was in February this year, it's usually in February. Uh, it, by the way, it appeals to young people. They're uh, mostly speaking to people under age 40 to try to get them on board with political advocacy for expanding this uh, in the Netherlands, uh, for expanding the criteria to completed life. And uh, I have a colleague who made a documentary film that I've been involved in who went to this week of euthanasia, and he uh, found the majority of attendees were young psychiatric patients. Uh, who, even though they can actually access this field, it's become much too restrictive for psychiatric patients. And what's interesting is they have some, some remarkable things. There's a seminar, for example, on the virtue opportunity of organ donation to turn your life uh, of adversity, uh, your life that feels uh, as if it's uh, failed, into an opportunity to give life for somebody new. And of course, who are the most eligible organ donors? young psychiatric patients who are otherwise physically healthy. They are prime organ donation, donators, so donors. So you can see the, the incredible sort of coercive milieu uh, in which these organizations uh, have been uh, attracting and luring in young people. See on the top of their website, do you have a death wish? Uh, you can click on that and you can learn more about Luke of Euthanasia. Uh, as in 2015, there were over 40 organ donations in Belgium and the Netherlands. And now, in Canada, with their new euthanasia laws, they're talking about uh, eliminating the dead donor rule so that you can go for your euthanasia and first go under anesthesia so that you can have your organ live harvested. And then, after it's been harvested and taken down the hall and put in somebody else, then they'll push the anesthesia the rest of the way 
finish the job and kill you. So they're arguing that this uh, would facilitate this virtue opportunity. All right, now let's move to Belgium. In Belgium, uh, hospitals there now have euthanasia suites. So you go to the hospital in one of the rooms, there is the euthanasia suite. There's no lower age limit since 2014 there. As a matter of fact, there have been three children euthanized uh, uh, there just in uh, 2016 to 17. Uh, and euthanasia tourism is allowed, although mostly it's non-psychiatric. So the Belgians are even more vigorous, particularly in the Flanders region, which is the northern part, that yellow part of the country. Overall, there's been a 900% increase in euthanasia since the 2002 law. Since between 2015 and 2016 alone, there was a 14% increase in euthanasias. So about 2% of all Belgians die at the hands of a physician, but in the Flanders region, over 6% of Belgians die at the hands of a physician. And there, uh, an estimated, according to this New England Journal article, about 40% of euthanasias are estimated to be unreported. If you look at just psychiatric patients, you see they're really taking off. Uh, again, from 2015 to 16, there was a 22% increase in psychiatric patients. But overall, about the same numbers that you're seeing in the Netherlands, most of them tend to be women. Most of them have mood disorders. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at this one study uh, between 2012 and 2015, here are the common psych the diagnoses of the 124 psych patients in those years that were euthanized, and you see Depression, dementia, and as we talked about before, borderline personality disorders are the most common diagnoses there. But a little bit more detail, you remember Dr. Liev Tienpont in, from the uh, film clip that I showed you. She is sort of the psychiatric Kevorkian uh, of the Netherlands. She uh, does, uh, that's wrong, it's not 70%. She does about 40% uh, of the euthanasias. I need to correct that. I am a pioneer, so I am loved and hated. She wrote this book, Free Me, on euthanasia and psychological suffering. So she is the chief exponent, the chief uh, uh, exponent and, uh, if I may uh, use the pun, executioner uh, of this idea. Uh, and interestingly, she seems to look a lot like Jack Kevorkian. There's some kind of a physiognomy associated with people that are pursuing this interest. So she published a, pap a paper on her first 100 patients. Now, Every one of her patients she's found completely competent to make the decision, even though 14 of them were psychotic, which again, she doesn't get into the details of the case, but as a, as a psychiatrist, the idea that 14 uh, psychotic patients could be competent also kind of rattles my mind. Remember the 5% acceptance rate in the Netherlands, she accepts them at 48%, uh, and 73% of those went on to be euthanized by the time this paper was written. And here are some of the diagnoses, most commonly, of course, major depression, but personality disorder, there it is again. Uh, these pesky people that are so difficult to live with, uh, that are so difficult to treat, uh, that uh, you know, there are uh, all sorts of ambivalences about both in the treatment team and in their families. But look at some of the others. Autistic spectrum disorders was number three. Number three, the third most common diagnosis. PTSD, complicated grief, ADHD. Uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, it really spans the entire spectrum of common psychiatric disorders that Dr. Lee of Tienpont euthanized. Uh, so look at how the slope slips. Uh, here's a pair of twins that were euthanized after they began to go blind. Uh, here's a young man who had ego dystonic homosexuality, really was unhappy about being a homosexual, and therapy was unable to help him convert. Uh, into heterosexuality. He was euthanized on request. Uh, here is a transgender man who had three attempts at conversion uh, surgery, uh, none of which left him uh, more satisfied. Uh, he was granted euthanasia. And then, taking it entirely out of a medical context, here is a person who was in a lifetime sentence for rape. He had unbearable suffering. He was very unhappy about being in jail. And was no prospect for recovery because he had a life sentence. They allowed him to be euthanized by the prison physician. So the story of the Catholic Church in Belgium is quite interesting. So here's one uh, uh, story in which the Catholic uh, Church, which for 15 years defended against euthanasia of patients in their facilities. And here they uh, 
actually were fined considerably for refusing to allow one of their nursing home patients to be euthanized. Uh, however, the fact is, is that uh, there's a Catholic order called the Brothers of Charity, uh, whose mission is psychiatric treatment. They minister to uh, people with mental health needs. They run the majority of psychiatric beds in Belgium. And for 15 years, they refused to allow euthanasia in their facilities until April 2017, when they drank the Kool-Aid and they uh, basically said, look, th this is what our society wants. Uh, and they came up with some fascinating theological rationalizations. Uh, and uh, they said, we are now going to open our facilities to psychiatric euthanasia. Well, the pope said, no, you're not. He said, euthanasia hides behind alleged compassion to justify killing a patient. The dignity of human life is at stake. Nothing must prevent you from putting more heart into your hands. Well, the chair of the board of the Brothers of Charity, who was also former uh, president of Belgium and the, also president of the European Union, uh, Erman van Rompuy, tweeted, the time of Roma locuta causa finita is long past. I probably don't need to translate that for this audience, but in case you don't know the old phrase, Rome has spoken, end of conversation, we're not in that time anymore. Uh, we'll do what we want. Uh, and so uh, there was that weekend of the face-off between the brothers. It just so happened I had previously been invited to speak to the largest uh, uh, brothers hospital uh, in Alexianian and Tienin in uh, Leuven. Uh, and I tried to be a bit of a Jeremiah and told them why you know, they were going down the wrong path. And I'm sorry to say that after I left, I failed to succeed. And they are sticking to their decision. And at the moment, they're trying to work out with Rome what's going to happen. I think uh, what's going to happen is they're probably going to just uh, uh, call, call their hospital, uh, be asked to take the Catholic Church's name off their hospital systems. Uh, and no longer represent themselves as coming from uh, a Catholic order. So there are many people in Belgium who have been uh, pushing against this, uh, many academics, many people actually also from Catholic University there. Uh, this is hot off the press this week. Uh, this uh, woman back in uh, 2016 was uh, euthanized for an autistic spectrum disorder which probably was a spurious diagnosis. She made up a lot of the history. Uh, uh, their family uh, was kind of recruited into it. Her father was asked to hold the needle in place while she was being killed by Dr. Thien Pont. And the sisters have uh, been very, very upset and angry and feel like it was not an appropriate euthanasia. And so uh, as of uh, last week, uh, they've opened a criminal investigation into Dr. Tienpont uh, regarding this one case. And it's interesting because just a couple of weeks earlier, there was a, a pro the first prosecution uh, is being pursued of uh, a case in the Netherlands about an elderly dementia patient who had written an advance directive, but when it came time to euthanize her, she refused, she struggled, they had to spike her coffee to give her a sedative, it didn't work. So the family and the doctor had to hold her down as she struggled as they tried to, to inject the needle. They were successful with it. They killed her. But uh, in fact, uh, it was such a terrible scene that uh, it is now being uh, the very first case in the history of the Netherlands to be investigated for possible prosecution. So both in Belgium and the Netherlands in this very month, we're seeing the opening of the first cases. Switzerland actually uh, also, I'm not going to spend much time on Switzerland, just to let you know that they've had euthanasia medical tourism since uh, 1992. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is uh, from the Dignitas organization that runs a lot of these clinics in Belgium. Uh, and this is their guidelines for persons affected by a psychiatric disorder, where they say it's a guaranteed human right that the Swiss federal court has granted the mentally ill the right just like anyone else. And uh, just yesterday, I heard from two colleagues on the same day about a patient who was trying to knock on their door to get an evaluation authorizing them as having an untreatable condition so that they could go and be a euthanasia tourist in Switzerland. So here is how the slope slips, ladies and gentlemen. It starts in every country with the non for the terminally ill, but it always quickly precesses to the non-terminal. Uh, the distinctions between physical and mental suffering are removed. 
Children are then allowed. Advanced directives are then allowed. Then mandated referrals by conscientious objectors. It, with psychiatric patients, it begins with the major mental illnesses. And then it progresses to the more minor mental illnesses, like uh, discomfort with your sexuality, or alcoholism, or tinnitus, uh, and uh, uncomfortable lifestyles. Then prisoners with life sentences. Then it progresses uh, through data that I didn't have time to show you tonight to proxy consent for those who are not competent to consent, who have their guardians consent for them. Then if you can't find the guardian or family members, the doctors themselves decide uh, that that life is not worth living. So they administer euthanasia or mercy killing. Then it progresses to completed life and tired of living. Uh, then the pill of Drion, the over-the-counter suicide pill, pill and talk of rational suicide then suicide tourism, and finally the Sarco. What's the Sarco, you may ask? Stand by, I'll show you the Sarco shortly. So just touching uh, and wrapping up about the ethics of this, the way I see it, unethical ethics are better than no ethics at all. The fact is, is that major world medical associations stand against this. Uh, the American Medical Association says that any of these practices are fundamentally incompatible with the role of a physician as healers, that was reaffirmed twice now in the last six months by the AMA Ethics Committee, who said, who was being challenged by some of their members who are living in states where this is legal. The AMA Ethics Committee said, you know, we've studied this, we've had hearings on this, we've uh, really given this a lot of thought. We do not think that this language should change. The World Medical Association says it's unethical and should be condemned. Uh, and this Oh, interesting side story there. The World Psychiatric Association is a little more wishy-washy. Well, a psychiatrist should be careful. The patient might be depressed. The views of the patient might be affected by their mental disorders. So, you know, just be careful. So uh, we at the uh, American Psychiatric Association felt that something stronger was needed. Now, the American Psychiatric Association stands with the American Medical Association uh, in saying that all forms of assisted suicide and euthanasia are not compatible with the fundamental ethos of being a physician. But we felt we needed an additional special statement, something to fire a shot across the Atlantic to land in Netherlands and Belgium. And so I was very instrumental in trying to craft this language, thread the needle of acceptable language, uh, and get it passed and became the official policy of the American Psychiatric Association in December of 2016, saying that a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. So this is now the ethics code uh, of the psychiatric profession. Uh, and in that sense, what's going on in Benelux is not considered ethical. So what, what are the potential arguments that are uh, in favor of this? Uh, you know, the, the fundamental arguments really are argued from the position of justice, of parity which is you know, that one of our most sacred tropes in mental health. But we shouldn't be treating the mentally ill any different from the physically ill. That mental suffering and physical suffering are really indistinguishable. Uh, that the competence of psychiatric patients could be, at least uh, potentially, the same as medical patients. That the usual standards of competence that, you know, to refuse surgery and things like that should apply. We, nobody's explored the outer limits of competence when it comes to these kinds of decisions. Uh, that you can't exclude any class of people, especially psych patients, once you set up a right. And in fact, excluding psych patients is stigmatizing. And the argument goes that passive euthanasia and active euthanasia are morally equivalent. Getting out of the way of death is really no different, say the proponents, than administering death. Uh, and that, uh, obviously, autonomy and self-determination are the highest values and that physicians are dedicated to beneficence, which is doing the right thing on behalf of the patients, not themselves. And sometimes that is, means relieving pain. And it may be necessary to actually kill the experiencer of pain is the only way to relieve pain. That uh, this is a right, and once you have a right, then somebody has a duty. And if it's a patient's right to have this, that means, ergo, it's the physician's duty uh, to provide it. Uh, an argument which we do not recognize here in the United States, that there exists something called futility in psychiatric, that, it, that rather than having problems accessing treatment, uh, paying for treatment, uh, getting good mental health care, uh, that 
the supposition is, no, no, there actually exist cases where, that we can't do anything about. That's very controversial. In some cases, the idea is suicide is inevitable, so they need a safer, more certain alternative to traditional suicide, and then, in fact, doing it this way, you can include the family. They won't be, they won't be so shocked. It'll be safe. It'll be certain. Nobody will you know, misfire a gun and be left you know, paralyzed for the rest of their life. Uh, and in fact, like Emily, peering over the edge may actually be therapeutic uh, and could actually be a deterrent for many. And we talked about the virtue opportunity of organ donation. But in point of fact, uh, you know, there, there are very strong ethical arguments against this. You know, in Belgium and the Netherlands, they've really been experimenting with uh, you know, the extreme uh, deployment of autonomy and legalizing marijuana, prostitution, now euthanasia, you know, they did the first two many, many years ago. Uh, William Lemons and Art Kaplan, the great American bioethicist, talk about the fetishizing of choice. Uh, and uh, one of the prominent uh, psychiatric ethicists in uh, the Netherlands feels that autonomy has derailed. Dan Silmasi of the Hastings Center says, look, autonomy is a very thin reed on which to rest the massive weight of legalized medical killing. Uh, these other authors, uh, bioethicists, the preeminence of autonomy as an ethical principle in the United States can sometimes lead healthcare providers to disregard other moral considerations and common sense when making clinical decisions. Because the fact of the matter is it's a kind of pseudo-autonomy. It appears to give the patient the autonomous choice when in point of fact, ultimately it's the physician who decides, right? It's the doctor who decides really just how unbearable is your illness. You know, I get to decide, patient A, I don't think they, they can bear it some more. Patient B can't bear it. I also get to decide uh, what, what claims are plausible. In, in psychiatry, patients refuse treatment all the time, and sometimes we actually override the refusal to, uh, and treat them involuntarily. So I get to decide. Ultimately, I'm the gatekeeper, so really it's a kind of a false autonomy. Uh, indeed, the entire issue of the role of autonomy in mental disorders is a very controversial one. There are many, many books that have been written about the way in which mental conditions might actually take an edge off, if not completely undermine autonomy under certain circumstances. There are many clinical considerations. To know what a prognosis of a condition is, you have to know what the diagnosis is. We're not very good at reliable diagnoses. Uh, we're a phenomenological science. We don't have another domain of validation like a blood test or a brain scan where we can go to and say, oh yeah, that's your diagnosis. So if you aren't sure about what the di diagnosis is, it's hard to be sure about the prognosis. And besides which, our patients are well known to have multiple diagnoses. Uh, substance abuse disorder and personality disorder and schizophrenia. So they're complicated, uh, uh, prog uh, it becomes very unpredictable. Uh, patients are often not truthful about their history, such as that autistic girl that's now, the case is under investigation uh, in Belgium. And there's so many different treatment options, uh, not all of which are necessarily accessible to patients, especially by third-party pairs. And indeed, if you think that anything you want is accessible in a socialized medical system like the Netherlands, like Belgium, you're wrong. You cannot get anything that you want psychiatrically in those countries. Matter of fact, a patient approached me when I was speaking in Brussels who said, let me tell you the best way to, to get the highest quality psychiatric care in this country. Ask for euthanasia. You ask for euthanasia. They're all over you, you know, trying to give you the options that they refused you uh, up until then. So many patients have learned that the way to shake the tree of services is to ask for euthanasia. Before we try assisted suicide, Mrs. Rose, let's give the aspirin a chance. So the science of prognosis uh, in psychiatry is very limited. Here's a recent review just uh, last month. Uh, basically, we're not very good uh, about predicting prognoses uh, in psychiatry. And then we have the problem of suicide contagion. Uh, in uh, October, at the height of attention to uh, Brittany Maynard with her brain tumor, remember she was advocating for assisted suicide and she actually probably is personally responsible for California passing the law, well the baseline uh, number of lethal prescriptions in Oregon, where it was uh, legal, rose 40% higher in the month that she was getting all the publicity, uh, the highest month in the previous five years. Here's another example of suicide contagion 
Uh, I know whether you're familiar with this Netflix uh, uh, drama about uh, a girl that ultimately commits suicide. Uh, during its airing, there were one and a half million more Google searches than prior to its airing on how to commit suicide. And in a recent study that just came out last week, as a matter of fact, they looked at kids in the ER for suicidal thinking, and half of them said watching 13 Reasons was very relevant to why they started to think suicidally. So we understand that there is a problem with suicide contagion. Uh, and so once you open the door to legitimizing one set of suicides, uh, then it opens the door to, uh, to everybody else uh, being under that influence. And in addition to suicide co uh, contagion, there's suicide coercion. This man was just sentenced to 10 years in jail for encouraging his wife to commit suicide so he could access her one and a half million dollar life insurance plan. So look at the uh, cartoon. Uh, we have suicide prevention program on the left and assisted suicide on the right. Notice which side the ramp is on. So, you know, we're giving mixed messages in our society. Dan Salmasi of the Kennedy Center says, this is why people living with disabilities are so fearful of legalized assisted suicide and other forms of medically assisted killing. It's the assault to their dignity that comes with the social sanction of the idea that lives characterized by incontinence, cognitive incapacity, and dependence on others are unworthy of life and so can be ended by direct killing. We throw a question smack in the face of countless disabled persons everywhere. Why are you still burdening yourself and us with your life? I have a colleague in uh, the Netherlands whose father is chronically ill then he could have been eligible for euthanasia. And he says his friends have pretty much silenced him from complaining about his illness, having said to him in many ways, not just one way, well, look, it's your choice. You could have had the euthanasia, you know. So quit your belly aching. So here's what happens. You know, freedom are liberties that can't inter uh, be interfered with. A right entitles you to a provision of resources. We have the freedom to own private property, but government uh, does not necessarily have to give us private property, but we have the right to vote. So government has to provide us the mechanisms, the voting machines, the election uh, uh, institutions to fulfill that right. So what's happened is society has basically shifted suicide from a freedom into a right. So once you make something a right, which Kevorkian called you know, a fundamental American right, like life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and Dignitas calls a guaranteed European human right to uh, end your life, that implies somebody has a duty. So the question is, whose duty is it? Uh, and I want to submit to you that uh, it is, is it the physician's duty? I want to submit to you that it is not the physician's duty. So therefore, if a government wants to transform suicide from a freedom to a right, it's the government's responsibility to provide uh, the, the ability to fulfill that right. Uh, so there were a generation, five generations of the Sansons uh, were royal executioners uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, France. And Virginia had its own state executioner up through 1989. So the term is laicide. Get it out of the house of medicine. Stand up a separate profession if you must. I don't think it's good public policy to transform suicide from a freedom to a right. But if you are going to transform that, then you need to stand up a different profession outside of the house of medicine. Killing does not belong in the house of medicine. John Mayer, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Medical Ethics, said there is something critically important about keeping the roles of bringer of comfort and bringer of death separate even if they are arguably on a conceptual continuum. So now we come to the promised Sarko. The Sarko is an invention of this oncologist in Australia, Philip Nitschke. Uh, and what he does is you take an online test. And if this online test, the computer decides if you are competent through the online test. It doesn't diagnose you. He doesn't care if you're depressed. He doesn't care if you have an illness of any sort. As long as you're competent, if you pass the test, you get the code, and the code takes you to this device where you go with a friend, you climb in, you close, close it on yourself, 
and it fills up with nitrogen, uh, and you're painless, painlessly and gradually uh, suffocated uh, within the course uh, of, uh, of several minutes, and then your friend is there to remove your body. So uh, this is uh, the cutting edge uh, of where the slippery slope uh, is cutting uh, as we go down the hill. So I submit to you that particularly in psychiatry, this is a fundamental inversion of the, the basic principles of what it means to do and be a psychiatrist. Uh, Scott Kim, who I told you collected a lot of this data at NIMH, says it's a core clinical imperative in psychiatric treatment to compassionately and skillfully help patients even through periods of sustained suffering during which people lose the will to live. Suicide prevention is what we do, and we do that independent of what the diagnosis is. We have the skill set in psychiatry to help people somehow find a path to a better future in the midst of their suffering. We are very experienced uh, and spend a lot of time with our patients compared to other specialists and accompany them in their journey of suffering. Uh, remember, the word compassion literally means to suffer with. Uh, so we have a variety of skill sets that we learn. We teach our students about how to suffer with a patient and not be drawn down into the rabbit hole of hopelessness with them. Uh, we try to mitigate suffering where we can, utilizing state-of-the-art treatments. Uh, we try to increase and maximize support and support systems. And indeed, we can even do something that may be of a particular uh, familiarity and consequence to a Catholic audience, uh, and that is we can actually even help people make meaning of suffering. Yes, that is possible for human beings to even make meaning of suffering. These are all part of the skill set of psychiatry. So to take a psychiatry, psychiatrist with psychiatric patients of all physicians and have that psychiatrist go from preventing suicide to providing suicide is an anathema, is an inversion of our fundamental ethos. John Mayer, again, just as the Pope should not perform abortions and the Dalai Lama should not take up arms, a psychiatrist should not counsel or abet suicide, for in doing so, we've misunderstood and betrayed our vocation and profession. Validation of suicide or assisted suicide by psychiatrists is therapeutic and professional hypocrisy. C.S. Lewis said, we all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, Progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. Uh, and I, I think that you know, we, we are indeed on the wrong road. As John Donne famously wrote in his poem, each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Uh, and indeed, I think it's tolling for the potential death of psychiatric ethics uh, as we know it, as we go down this pathway. Paul McHugh, who addressed uh, this center several years ago, my mentor, former chairman of psychiatry at Hopkins, uh, one of my more revered teachers, who wrote uh, very vociferously about Kevorkian back in the Kevorkian days, uh, writes, patients are seduced by isolating them, sustaining their despairs, revoking alternatives, stressing examples of others choosing to die, and sweetening the deadly poison by speaking of death with dignity. If even psychiatrists succumb to this complicity with death, what can be expected of the lay public? I leave you with the words of Winston Churchill, never give up, never give up, never, 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 especially if you're a healthcare professional. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Comrade, for that excellent presentation. Um, I think being mindful of the time, and I know especially this time of year, um, we'll save our questions for the reception, so we'll just invite you all to join us in the atrium now. We can continue our conversation. I'm sure Dr. Comrade will be happy to take any questions. Please. And if you would, just join me once again in thanking Dr. Comrade for being here this evening. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me.